Freedom of speech. Fundamental rights. Freedom of uh, conscience. Academic freedom. Freedom of press. And the right to listen. You're listening to So to Speak, the free speech podcast brought to you by FIRE, the foundation for individual rights in education. Okay, welcome back to So to Speak, the free speech podcast, where every other week we take an uncensored look at the world of free expression through personal stories and candid conversations. As always, I am your host, Nico Perino. Our guest today has been on the show before, so he's probably familiar to some of you. He is Keith E. Whittington, and he is the William Nelson Cromwell Professor of Politics at Princeton University. He's also the author of Speak Freely, Why Universities Must Defend Free Speech, and since his last appearance on the show, he joined FIRE's Board of Directors and just recently launched the Academic Freedom Alliance, which is a union of faculty members dead set upon coming to each other's defense when their expressive and academic freedom rights are violated. Sometimes, as I understand it, in the court of law and other times in the court of public opinion. Professor Whittington, welcome back onto the show. Thanks for having me. Really appreciate it. And congratulations on the launch of AFA. Thanks. It uh, it felt like a long time to get to that point. We were uh, working on it behind the scenes, and uh, it's just a remarkable number of steps one has to take to uh, get an organization up and running. But I'm I'm very glad to have it publicly launched now, and um, to really be able to get to work. Well, a lot of the stuff that I imagine goes into creating an organization. I've never created one myself before. I've created a department within an organization, but I imagine a lot of it is administrative, like getting your tax exempt status, getting. Uh, your email set up, getting, you know, just kind of boring, mundane stuff. It's not a lot of it is the mission, uh, so to speak. (laughs) There is a lot of that, just uh, getting the forms in place, uh, getting uh, the website set up, the the uh, email set up, as you say, it's... um, uh, there is a remarkable amount of that, all of which, uh, as, as seems like every task I ever undertake, uh, all that takes longer than one expects. Um, but then it also uh, took some time just to try to think through the organization and what we were trying to do and how we were going to organize it and what the best way of proceeding was. Um, and then it took time to sort of talk to people about joining the organization. And, and um, that at least feels much more like time well spent than the kind of effort of how do we get the website up and running. But, uh-huh. it's, uh, uh, but you know, I think at the end of the day, it, it paid real dividends. I'm, I'm very happy with where we are now. And um, I'm, I, I think we're in a good position to be able to be helpful. And all of it being done, of course, amidst a pandemic. What's your life and teaching environment like right now? Uh, are you still all remote? Uh, we are pretty much remote. So Princeton um, allowed students to come back to campus um, in a restricted way. Um, so there's uh, some set of them that are living on campus. There are some set of them who are living in the larger Princeton area. Um, and then some of them are just living all over the world. Um, uh, but our classes are very restricted. And so almost all the classes at Princeton this semester are still virtual. Um, uh, in the fall, we're hoping that we're sort of back to something that looks basically like normal. Um, but, but this semester, it's a very virtual environment. And so, so I've been going a full year now where I'm basically working entirely out of my home office. What's it like to teach uh, in a virtual environment? And I guess for the purposes of our conversation, given this is the free speech podcast, how do the dynamics change in conversations or dialogue surrounding issues, and in particular contentious issues? I imagine there's not just the hesitancy that might come in discussing contentious issues, but there's also the worry that what you're saying might be recorded. You know, you can't read facial expressions as easily. What what have you learned over these past? months. Yeah, no, I think there are certainly some difficulties um, uh, with doing things virtually. Um, uh, I, I do think the concern about people being recorded is a real risk. Um, mm-hmm. And we have seen some faculty get in trouble from uh, the fact that their um, classes are, are being recorded. Um, of course, some schools are automatically recording the, the classes uh, to make them available to students who can't attend and things like that. And so we're getting sort of some routine recordings that are occurring. Um, uh, most of my classes do not get routinely recorded in that way, but it's just easier for any individual participating in the class to record what's going on um, uh, when you're in this virtual environment. And so they, I think there is a heightened risk um, that uh, stuff might uh, be exposed to the public. And I think that 
uh, can make people um, a little wary about what they want to say. I mean, I think the the other sort of more um, immediate challenge of of doing a lot of these things online is you just don't have as much opportunity to get to know people. Um, uh, mm-hmm. the, the the personal interaction, even in the classroom itself, in addition to sort of the stuff that occurs, you know, outside the classroom and and as you're entering and exiting uh, classes and the like. Um, uh, you know, you, you miss that. And, um, and so there is a bit of a concern that people just don't feel as comfortable with one another uh, to engage in conversation. I think we've had pretty good luck um, for the most part in the classes I've been doing um, that's, that students do get comfortable with one another fairly well in, in this virtual environment so that they get engaged by the material and start interacting. Um, the conversations are not quite as free flowing. You do have to orchestrate the the question and answers a little. You more. You have that and awkward so, where you, you can, yeah. you know, which we'll probably have during this podcast. Exactly. Uh, you know, where you're like trying to interject, but there's some uh, latency in the bandwidth and. Well, and it's just much tougher when you're talking six, seven, twelve students as opposed to two people in a conversation. Even right, it's a little tricky even with just a couple of people doing it this way. But um, you know, you get twelve people. It does require a little more management, I think, to get people sort of in and out. Because otherwise, you can pretty quickly wind up talking over one another and having a lot of awkwardness <clears throat> we, making um, that work. We we at Fire last year did our kind of pilot college free speech rankings, which is based on a survey of 21,000 students uh, at 55 colleges across the country. And we're expanding that this year to 150 colleges and tweaking the survey based on responses and critiques we received, but also based on the changing environment, of course, which is uh, the pandemic. And we asked students in, in the survey, are you fully remote, partially remote, all in person? And uh, also asked them whether they feel like it's, if, if they're have previous experience in person on a college campus, whether they feel like it's more difficult to have open and honest conversations. And uh, the early data that we're receiving from about 4,500 respondents is that it's split. It's like a third think it's easier, a third think it's harder, and then a third just don't quite know, think it's about the same. Uh, so we don't know what to make of that. Sometimes when you want to talk about data, uh, it's easier <laughs> if it's all pointing in one direction. But when I think about having difficult conversations and talking across lines of difference, I, I I feel like the more you know someone, the more you can see them, read their facial expressions, get to know them outside the context of that conversation, the more presumption of goodwill you bring to the discussion. And that's why I think like Twitter, for example, is such a cesspool, you know, it's right. completely anonymized. And of course, when thinking about that, you can think on a spectrum, Twitter being over here, in-person conversations over here, and then these sort of digital conversations uh, somewhere in the middle. So I imagine it's, I, you know, I don't know. I think we're still at the point where we're trying to learn how, learn about what the outcomes and effects of this are, but I, I just have to imagine instinctively that it'd be more difficult. I think it's got to be really hard for first year students in particular, and I and I have not taught very many first year students during the course of this. But but those are the people who um, really have no background to fall on. It's their first exposure to a college level class in many instances, and so they don't know what to expect in general. But they also don't know the other students at all, right? And they haven't had the opportunity to start getting to know the other students. Whereas um, you know, people who've already at least been a year on campus, um, even if it was the disrupted uh, year of, of last year, um, you at least know people to a greater degree. You know the campus environment more generally. You do then, as a consequence, have somewhat more collegiality um, that makes it a little easier to um, uh, uh, expect that there's going to be ongoing interactions with people at least, and you can draw from that a little bit. I have mixed reactions, I think, a little bit in thinking about the sort of assumption of goodwill that um, goes with this. I do I do think that is a problem on Twitter, uh, for example, on social media, where you're having these one-off interactions. It's very easy to assume bad will on other people's part. Mm-hmm. You don't have any kind of ongoing relationship with people. And so it's it's possible to behave pretty badly in that context and uh, not have the kind of repercussions you might have in a normal environment where you have repeated interactions with people. Um, on the other hand, I went to a very large school as an undergraduate. I went to University of Texas at Austin. Mm-hmm. Um, uh, one thing I liked about that environment 
was in some ways how anonymous you were. <laughs> and yeah. so I went yeah, to Indiana University, into... which is right. not as large as UT Austin, but almost, I think, 30,000 yeah, I mean, undergrads. So, so a lot of, I mean, some of the classes I uh, were not like that. I, I was taking the same classes over and over again with people in part because I was part of some smaller programs where it's the same students were sort of put together to, to go through multiple classes. But in a lot of instances, I'd walk into a classroom and I would never see those people again. I wouldn't see them outside of class. I had no larger interaction with them. Um, and at one consequence of that was I didn't worry as much about what they thought and what the consequences mm -hmm. of what I might say in that context is. One challenge, I think, for students at a very small school like Princeton um, is that they know all those people who are in that classroom. They're going to continue interacting with them. On the one hand, that can allow you to say, well, I know this person in other contexts and, and I know they're generally a person of goodwill. And so I ought to be charitable about how um, I interpret what they say. On the other hand, it also means if you say something particularly embarrassing or, or particularly controversial, um, uh, that's going to carry with you for the rest of your four years potentially and people yeah. aren't going to let you forget it. And, and so it can make people, I think, somewhat cautious about what they're willing to say because the, the uh, weight of what they say seems particularly heavy um, in that kind of context where even if they don't think it's going to be recorded, uh, they nonetheless know that there is an, uh, uh, that this has, this has consequences outside the immediate context of the, of the classroom and people are sort of second guessing themselves to some degree by, by worrying about, um, uh, you know, what, what are people going to think because of this thing I said in, in class this one time? Yeah, that's actually one of the findings of our, our surveys is that students are primarily concerned, or I shouldn't say primarily, largely concerned about what their peers think of them. Uh, and that drives a lot of self-censorship. And, you know, there's there's only so much you can do about that, of course, because you need we at FIRE adopt the strong student model, which is that you got to be strong enough to live with these freedoms. You have the freedom to speak out, but you also need to be strong enough to uh, deal with the critique. But, you know, I think now is actually a good time to get into the AFA because, um, you know, last year was a heck of a year. And we were hearing reports from faculty and students across the country who were self-censoring, who were facing punishment for speaking out. Uh, you said you've been working on this a long time. I assume the impetus came last summer when fire was seeing hundreds fold uh, increases in its case intake and faculty left and right were worried about the environment for academic freedom and open discussion. What was what what led to the creation of AFA? Yeah, our conversations about it really began before that, although oh, interesting. Um, certainly some of our recruitment and our conversations with people joining the group uh, were coming after that. But, um, um, you know, in some ways, there, a group of us at Princeton have been talking for several years now about sort of the larger free speech environment, how students were thinking about free speech, um, uh, not only in sort of in the specific context of, of campuses, but also more broadly. It's part of what led us then uh, to uh, want to adopt the Chicago Statement as sort of contributing to that national conversation about free speech. It's part of what led me to write the book Speak Freely um, as part of an effort to sort of talk through those things. And so we continue to kick around other ideas about well, what can we do to help um, advance better understandings of these things, help um, better implement free speech principles in practice. Um, uh, uh, one of the ideas one of my colleagues at Princeton um, had uh, thrown out a while ago now uh, was the idea of some kind of insurance policy for faculty so that they could um, uh, avail themselves of legal protection if and legal help if, if they found themselves in the midst of one of these controversies. Um, and nothing really came of it right away until we um, uh, found ourselves with a donor who was willing to put up some money and could say, look, I'm, I'm happy to help um, uh, improve the situation in higher education. And, and then we started thinking, well, some of these ideas we might be able to put in practice. And that really sort of started coming together in the spring of 2020. Um, and and then it was this sort of lengthy process to get the thing off the ground. And, and part of that was trying to think about the details of, well, what exactly is this um, uh, organization going to look like and who ought to be members of it and, and, and that kind of thing. Um, but, but this does reflect, I think, our long-term concerns about where we are in higher education, where we are in these speech conversations more generally. Um, it happens that we're now in the midst of, of an even greater crisis uh, than we seemed to be a year or so ago. Um, but, um, but, you know, it's, it's 
been a worry for a while now uh, about the situation. And uh, it's it seemed quite evident we needed um, an organization like this um, even a few years ago, let alone right now. Yeah, a group of professors coming to each other's defense when they are uh, you know, facing some of the free speech and academic freedom problems that we've seen across the country in recent years. Princeton being the ground zero, I mean, you talk about the adoption of the Chicago statement, you talk about uh, your book, Speak Freely, which I believe, correct me if I'm wrong, was assigned as like a first year read or as a campus wide read. Yeah, no, that's right. So uh, so our president, uh, when he began his presidency, had um, uh, begun a program of uh, giving incoming first year students a, a book to read over the summer that there was some programming connected to when they arrived on campus uh, one year. Um, it was my book, Speak Freely, but he also distributed copies of that, not only to the incoming first year class, but to everyone else on campus um, as well. Um, President Eisgruber has been quite vocal on the importance of free speech um, and academic freedom to what universities do. Um, so it's been a very supportive environment in that sense at Princeton. We have good policies in place. I think we implement them fairly well. Um, we do have senior leadership that has spoken out on these issues. And so... Um, uh, for I think a lot of us at Princeton, the concern is often less about what's happening immediately on our own campus uh, than what's happening nationally, where um, lots of faculty find themselves at places where there's a lot less support uh, for uh, free speech principles. The policies are not as well uh, designed to protect free speech principles. Uh, university leaders are not as committed and they're more willing uh, to cave under pressure uh, when controversies erupt. Um, and so those of us who are in relatively good positions uh, to be able to speak out on these issues, I think have a particular responsibility then uh, to be speaking out on these issues and help defend those uh, who are in much more vulnerable circumstances. Yeah, Princeton's an, an interesting school because, as you know, Eis Gruber has been vocal in defense of these values, and most recently in his State of the University letter, in which he not only defends free speech and academic freedom, um, but defends the larger enterprise of uh, truth searching, which you know we protect in a university environment because, well, we protect free speech and academic freedom because it helps lead to truth. He, and, and he also kind of echoes the Kelvin report, which was issued uh, by the University of Chicago many decades ago amidst the uproar over communism and anti-war protests and all that, in which he said, you know, which the Kelvin report said and Eisgruber echoed, you know, university shouldn't take collective positions uh, on hot button social issues of the day because doing so would have the effect of inhibiting the full freedom of dissent uh, which needs to thrive on a university campus. The idea being that you create a kind of uh, pull of orthodoxy on a campus by taking positions on hot button social issues. Uh, so th his letter was fantastic, but at the same time, he kind of says, in some cases, however, my colleagues and I in the university and administration will need to speak up for what um, we call the basic tenets, including commitments to racial equity and inclu inclusivity. <laughs> What does that mean exactly? I mean, it, to, for many people, it can mean debates over policing, you know, a social policy issue. It can mean a f debates over affirmative action, or Title IX. So he, he makes a very good general statement, but almost creates a carve out for himself that you could drive a truck through, which um, creates com some concerns for me, especially when you look at last year's Joshua Katz situation, in which Joshua Katz, a tenured professor at Princeton, wrote an op-ed for the Quillette, an Australian publication, uh, in the midst of the Black Lives Matter protests and the um, anti-racism activism happening all over the country, in which he criticized a now defunct student group called Black Justice League at Princeton uh, and called them a small local terrorist organization that made life miserable for many who did not agree with its members. Uh, Eisgruber responded uh, in, to the university community in, in that case. Uh, noting that cats failed to responsibly exercise free speech, whatever that means. I don't know that you can irresponsibly exercise a right within the scope of that right, but that's a debate for another place. So, and you know, on the one hand, Princeton is great, but on the other hand, you have these, these, and they're a red light school too, they've got a bad acceptable use policy. But on the other hand, you have these small issues that seem to pop up where there's, they want to have it both ways. Yeah, no, I think that's fair. Um, uh, President Eisgruber, uh, I think it's been thought quite thoughtful about um, uh, the circumstances under which a president should be able to issue statements. Um, it's 
it uh, has some real limits to it. Um, he does think that in general, um, uh, university's leaders ought to stay out of these disputes and let faculty um, uh, speak out on their own behalf, but the institution itself should not uh, be very involved. Um, but he has some specific um, context in which he thinks um, uh, the university president on behalf of the institution ought to um, be speaking out. Um, some, I think I, I'm uh, am more in agreement with than, than others. So for example, um, he does think that um, matters that affect uh, university operations and university uh, policy um, uh, should um, uh, be open for presidential comments. And so things like affirmative action, Title IX, for example, um, are not just public policy disputes about which people disagree, but they're also things that have immediate consequences for the university and how it operates. Um, and as a consequence, the university has an official position, an institutional position, an institutional stake in those, in those policy debates, and the president ought to speak out on them. Some of these other areas, I think, are, and, and I'm actually quite sympathetic, I think, with that particular uh, kind of uh, uh, category. Um, others, I think, are um, a little more difficult. Um, uh, and the one involving Joshua Katz is, is certainly one of them, I think, um, uh, in which um, uh, President Eisgruber thinks that there's more space there for the president to speak out and criticize, in this case, speak out to criticize faculty speech um, and things uh, Professor Katz had said. Um, uh, I am not terribly supportive of presidents uh, doing that, although I think that the threat is relatively small from that. Um, but it is potentially problematic. I think I think he, President Eisenhower was somewhat careful in how he did it. But but even so, there's lots of instances of university presidents uh, criticizing faculty in the midst of these disputes. Um, where even if the president, um, which they aren't always, but even if they're reasonably careful to say um, that, of course, the faculty member here is is legally protected in what he does and cannot be sanctioned um, or disciplined or fired for having engaged in this controversial speech, um, there's lots of other faculty on that campus um, who uh, are likely to get the signal um, that they probably shouldn't speak out, um, not just because a university president might uh, issue some kind of counter statement. Um, but if if you were a untenured faculty member, if you're an adjunct faculty member whose um, uh, position depends on being rehired every semester uh, to teach classes, for example, um, you would quite properly um, uh, be pretty cautious about uh, saying things that would earn you a presidential rebuke um, out of fear that um, uh, saying those things would not only earn you a, a rebuke, but also uh, might lead to you not having your contract renewed. Um, and, and so there's a real chilling effect, I think, for people in the position of a president of a university um, who have that kind of power over at least some of the faculty um, uh, being qu quite that vocal um, in criticizing faculty and speaking out um, against them. And as a consequence, I think uh, presidents of universities are much better off if they're extremely cautious uh, about what it is they, they say. Yeah, I... I can, I can only imagine the various demands and interests that a president of a university faces from all its various stakeholders, faculty, students, legislators, parents, uh, donors to the university, and you're trying to please them all, right? Uh, but when you try and please everyone, you end up pleasing no one uh, is the way it ends up working out. And when you kind of venture into critiquing or criticizing a faculty member, I feel like it opens the door and gives people who want you to criticize faculty who they disagree with uh, an opening to make further demands because they've seen it's worked before. Um, I think that's right. Although I think that it's, um, I mean, one virtue of a place like Princeton, besides the policies and besides, I think, the general culture and, and a generally good uh, university leadership on these things, one of the virtues of Princeton is it's very well resourced. Um, and so as a consequence, it's possible to ride out uh, these kinds of immediate controversies. Uh, it's, it's possible that if donors say, um, look, I don't like the fact that you've got this faculty member on your campus who's saying these controversial things, I'm not going to give you any money uh, this year. Um, that Princeton will be fine uh, without those donations. There's lots of other universities where that's much less true. Um, and they're much more dependent upon ongoing gifts. Um, they're much more dependent on particular donors. 
in some cases, they're highly dependent on politicians. And so um, university presidents, I think, are in a, a very difficult bind um, in, in those places uh, where a politician is breathing down their neck and saying, uh, we don't know what your funding is going to look like next year because of this controversial professor. And the president's trying to figure out how do you get the politician to back off uh, while also hopefully they're also thinking about how do you secure academic freedom? There's a situation more- kind of like that in Idaho right now involving right. some uh, sort of moral and ethics course that's a requirement for graduation. And apparently a student recorded a professor humiliating them for being white. And I say um, apparently because no one's actually seen the video, but the <laughs> so I don't know what's actually in it. Um, I don't know if it actually constituted something like hostile environment harassment or discrimination. It very well could have, but um, the they shut it down because of legislative pressure. Uh, and the legislature in Idaho had been looking to kind of end that course for a long time, and they might have found their opening. But the, you know, two, just two points on, on this topic before we move on more to AFA is, uh, one, I can only imagine what it's like to be a professor who receives a, a presidential rebuke, especially at a prestigious uh, and world-renowned university like Princeton. I, you know, if if the if I saw the president of my small organization fire doing that with employees, I I would be horrified, um, and I'm sure my other employees would be very careful about what they say um, in the future, knowing that that's a possibility. But I've also seen presidents do it to students. <laughs> We've seen presidents do that to students and talk about, you know, I'm not saying it is hostile environment, but talk about a hostile environment on campus for you. Um, so, uh, you know, I, it does, it, I have to think it does create a profound chilling effect and one that w- would, um, really affect the environment for freedom of expression and open discourse on campus. I, I do think it's important for all of us on campuses to bear in mind the power relationships involved in some of these conversations. And so, uh, university presidents have a lot of power. And so, uh, I do think it's a consequence of that. They have to be somewhat careful in what they say. And they're not situated like a faculty member where the point of being a faculty member is precisely that you engage in arguments about various things. One, thing that university presidents have to do is step away from that role um, and not engage in those arguments in the same fashion because they're no longer appear um, in the same way with with their faculty colleagues. Well, that's, a, what the, that's what the Kelvin report said is we are the yeah. host of the critics, not the critics themselves. No, that's that's right. That's absolutely right. But it's also true, for example, as a, as a faculty member writing about campus free speech issues lately, for example, I've also been pretty cautious about what I say about students, um, and which is complicates uh, talking about campus free speech, because on the one hand, the controversies involve students. Students are often the ones calling for faculty to be fired or have, are shutting yeah, making down making illiberal and demands. They're we making at fire of illiberal always demands. defend their right to make those illiberal demands, but right. we will morally and ethically argue against them. Right. And so, you know, on the one hand, I right. So you want to argue about the substance and, and you want to focus on the arguments themselves. On the other hand, um, I what I also want to be somewhat careful not to do um, is is uh, single out the the student themselves and um, uh, and throw a lot of ad hominem attacks out at individual students and in in part because they're students and they're learning and they may in fact change their views over time and it's and I should I don't think I want to assume that some student who writes an op ed in a student newspaper um, is is wedded to that position for the next twenty years and so I don't necessarily want to single out that student in for example a book. Um, about campus free speech issues. But on the other hand, I'm also cautious about aware of the fact, at least, that that as a professor, I'm encountering those students in a different way than if I was a peer of those students um, and and criticizing them for their speech. And so, um, uh, again, that, that has sometimes led me to, to want to engage in the substance of the arguments, but try as much as possible to separate it from the author of those arguments um, so that uh, as much as possible, I'm not attacking the individuals. It's a tricky thing to do, though, as to how do you balance those things where you can actually engage in the arguments that are important and are live issues on your campus, for example, or in the larger public arena, um, without necessarily um, coming down on top of uh, some of the individuals who are sometimes in vulnerable positions and yet nonetheless making these arguments that I think ought to be identified and criticized. There are um, one of the things tactically, I mean, if you're 
you're jumping into the debate and criticizing a professor because you're receiving demands to do so. You know, I know when Joshua Katz wrote that in Quillette, there were students uh, making demands. There had already been a petition on behalf of 350 faculty members at Princeton calling for a curtailment of academic freedom uh, to a certain extent. But we have seen tactically professors who make a strong and unequivocal statement in defense of free speech and academic freedom without saying anything about the content of the speech. Uh, when they do that publicly, it takes um, the oxygen out of the, the, the debate or the, the calls. Like, for example, the best gold standard I've ever seen was in 2001 when University of Alaska President Mark Hamilton, uh, in response to demands to punish a poet on campus who had written a poem about sexual abuse in Native American communities, uh, issued a memo, one-page memo. He was a uh, former lieutenant general in the army, so he was very uh, saying, you know, where uh, where free speech and constitutional values are concerned, there is nothing to investigate, there is nothing to look into. Essentially, that was it, you know, because there were calls to investigate, to punish, and he said, there's nothing to investigate where the First Amendment's concerned. And then you I have- I think those kind of minimal, straightforward statements are the best ones. Um, and, and really, they, they ought to be the model for what university presidents do. Um, That's what you got it, at the University of the Arts, too, with Camille Paglia a couple of years ago. Yeah. Uh, yeah. Took the air right out of the room, out of the demands. Right. It, the controversy ended right there. Right. No, I think that's I, I think that's the best option. Um, and I think, uh, you know, sometimes university presidents simply want to do more than that. Sometimes they're under a lot of pressure to do more than that. I think sometimes they're just not thinking it through as well as they should. Um, but I would certainly prefer that university presidents essentially always take that position of, uh, and, and I'd be happy if they added to that, not only is this protected speech and, and therefore there's nothing to investigate, nothing, uh, to do about it. Um, but in addition, even to emphasize that, that we expect to have controversial speech on college campuses, college campuses are, um, as the Calvin Port emphasized, they are places that are homes to controversies, home to disputes, home to arguments. And, and this is in fact the brand. Um, and so there is such an instinct on the part of university presidents to say, well, you know, we've been selling students and parents on the idea this is a uh, happy, fun place to spend your time. Uh, and we don't do nearly enough, I think, to uh, 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 advertise to them. Uh, this is a place where we're going to take ideas really seriously. and We're going to have uh, uh, serious arguments about ideas um, that sometimes you're going to find um, uh, difficult. Um, and, and you're certainly going to encounter things that are going to be controversial um, uh, in the midst of those. And that's good. That's what you would hope to get yeah. out of your college campus. And, and, I, and I, I find it a little unfortunate that university presidents, I think, are very unwilling uh, to make that positive case for what it is we're doing on universities and why we're doing it. Speaking of controversial ideas, uh, is your fellow colleague uh, Peter Singer a member of AFA? Because I had him on the podcast last year to talk about his journal of controversial ideas, and he seems very uh, on board with everything that you're saying here. He is. No, Singer's very good about these issues, as you'd expect. He's in, he certainly, well, I guess uh, at these days you can't expect it necessarily. But the fact is that he, he has lots of controversial ideas himself. He's no... Um, uh, he's not someone that's unfamiliar with, uh, the kinds of calls for, uh, being punished and, and fired as a consequence of, of making arguments on behalf of controversial ideas. Um, uh, and, and some people though, who do that, um, are actually not very good on the free speech front. They want their own rights, uh, to speak out defended, but they actually don't care very much about other people's rights. And sometimes they're actively involved in trying to suppress other people. That's not true of Singer. Singer is somebody who, um, understands these are important principles, um, generally in universities, he's willing to defend everybody um, in, the, in the speech rights uh, that they engage in um, and, and believes in universities as being places where we actually um, argue and debate about controversial ideas, not just that we develop orthodoxies about controversial um, ideas. And so uh, Singer, in lots of ways, is the very model of what you'd want um, a professor to be like. Is you're saying that, you know, this reminds me, it's like, it's very easy to support these values in the abstract. Um, and you find that in polling, people support free speech, they support academic freedom, they support the right to peaceably assemble when you're talking about the values in the abstract. But when the rubber hits the road, and you're asking about whether neo-Nazis should be able to assemble in a town full of uh, Holocaust survivors, the, the support precipitously drops. So are you confident that the members who are now members will stick with you, um, you know, once the rubber hits the road, that they'll sign these statements, that they'll hang around when, for example, a professor is under fire 
for using the N word in a pedagogical sense in class. And there are, you know, a bunch of anti-racism activists who are at their throats. I mean, will they stay around and will the union hold when the going gets tough? Well, I certainly hope so. Uh, we have emphasized that um, to everybody joining that um, we're look, we're defending people across the board, and um, and and we've really asked people to reflect on um, one what these civil libertarian positions actually entail, mm-hmm. um, and two how committed are they really to them. Um, and there's all kinds of reasons why uh, you can imagine when you get off the bus um, on some of these controversies. You can imagine uh, simply thinking uh, that you do not want to spend your time and energy um, defending people who you th- that deeply disagree with. Um, even if you actually believe in the principles themselves, you may think, I don't want to be on the front lines uh, dealing with, with these kinds of, of controversies. You might imagine, that, in fact, the more you think about it, that there are at least um, some boundaries that, that you're not willing to cross and that there are uh, going to be some kinds of, of speech that is legally protected within bounds for what universities can do, um, then the, nonetheless you find so personally repellent that you're um, not willing to uh, come to their defense, um, uh, for example, um, even if you perhaps don't imagine that you'd be yourself wanting to suppress them. Um, you know, so we, we have really encouraged people to to think carefully about those things um, and 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 they have remained on board. And so I have a great deal of confidence, I think, in the people who've joined up. Um, some of them, I have a lot of reason to be confident about it because a fair number of them are First Amendment scholars and, and law professors and others who actually have spent a fair amount of time thinking about these issues, understands the understand the broader uh, principles at stake. Um, I think others are further removed from these. This is not part of their day-to-day scholarly life, not something they think about all that much. And so we've tried to encourage them to think carefully about about what it is they're signing on to. Um, and, and so I, I have a fair amount of confidence, but we'll see. I do think it's it's going to be terribly important. Pa- partially, it's very important to, in assembling the, the members of the alliance. We emphasize that um, uh, we are non-ideological. We are going to defend people from the left and the right. We're going to defend people across the board. Um, we're not coming at this from a single direction. We're not only interested in defending people for certain kinds of attacks or who have certain kinds of positions. Um, and and that was a very a message that had a lot of resonance. Um, people people were enthusiastic about that kind of project. Um, they were happy to be joining a group that was um, as cross ideological as we are, um, uh, and and so they wanted to build a broad coalition. Um, I think part of it, and so I, so we've done great job so far. I think people have come on board, uh, committed these principles. I do think there's going to be a challenge when we actually encounter. Um, and start defending specific speech acts, um, both in the sense that you could easily find yourself um, uh, having to defend somebody um, who perhaps is, has not behaved in the most judicious fashion possible. Perhaps they've really staked out a set of positions that people find particularly abhorrent, um, and yet we're going to be asking people to defend uh, people in those circumstances. And, and so when the rubber hits the road, that can be uh, difficult sometimes. Um, and of course, um, we have promised that we will be defending people across the board, that that this is not just um, t- concerned with defending people on one side of the political aisle or the others. But it's entirely possible we may get a, a slew of cases that all do lean one direction, politically speaking. Um, and so in any given moment, you may look at it and say, well, look, the last five cases you took um, were all from the political left or all from the political right. Um, what's going on here? Um, and so it's going to be, well, you know, and, and that, you know, Ira Glasser, who's a big mentor for me, ran the ACLU for many years, always said, and always tells me, he's like, you guys don't pick your clients, (laughs) the the censors or would be censors pick your clients. So you can't help if at that time, all of your clients are coming from the political right or political left. It's just, it's just what's, what's going on. And I, you know, I would encourage you. Uh, I would just say, don't be worried when you lose members because you will lose members. Uh, you know, that's probably baked into the business model is that people, once they see how it actually goes, will, um, you know, jump off ship. But the people who remain will, will be a strong force for good on these campuses. I mean, you've got 200 already, which is a huge number. It's a large uh, Even number if it's just 10, it is helpful to the cause, you know, we're, right now we're not getting any. And, and moreover, it's going to be more. Um, and so uh, when we first started thinking about this, we thought, 
you know, maybe we can get a few dozen people who are willing to, which do would this. still be and, huge, which would still be huge. And if they were the right people, that would be terrific. And it turns out that in fact, there was such an enthusiastic response that we pretty quickly overshot our initial goal. And then we had overshot the target we set after that. And so, so 200 people was far more than we were initially hoping to get or expecting to get, or felt like we needed to get in order to get this thing off the ground. Um, and so uh, we were extraordinarily happy then with how many people were interested. What's also striking is we've been publicly launched um, as of this recording for a little over a week now. Um, and we're just getting inundated with requests from people who want to join. Um, and, uh, so, and But your membership is closed right now, right? So we are um, uh, going to sort of grow in a managed way. Um, a part of our commitment as an organization is uh, we are absolutely committed to providing support to people who are members of the organization um, if they find themselves uh, in under threat um, and they have legally defensible claims. Um, and so uh, we have to be a little bit cautious then that we can actually ma- sustain that commitment um, with the resources we have available to us. Um, so if we immediately opened our doors and had tens of thousands of members, and as a consequence, potentially had uh, lots and lots of controversies we had to be weighing in on and defending, um, uh, we might uh, be pretty quickly overwhelmed. Um, uh, we do proactively want to take on some controversies that do not involve members because we're trying to advance these principles more generally. Um, there are lots that we were purposely choosing people initially to be founding members who were uh, not that vulnerable, that they are distinguished faculty from uh, impressive institutions. And in part, we wanted them because we thought their voices would carry some weight with university presidents and the like. But in the long run, if you're going to be really effective, you got to be able to protect people who are in much more vulnerable circumstances than that. Um, and that will mean, for the time being, at least reaching out to defend some people um, uh, who are not necessarily members. So we are going to manage our growth. Uh, we do expect to um, grow over time. We, we're taking um, uh, requests about uh, uh, membership, and then we are um, selectively inviting some people in. But I do expect we will be um, growing over time, um, but we've also just seen a tremendous amount of interest, uh, which is very heartening. Um, and uh, but also suggest uh, how big of a problem is out there. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> there's, a, of there's a lot of people who are very nervous about their current situation, and um, so they're enthusiastic about having another group like this. Yeah, yeah. The you know, growing in a managed way is smart too, because especially where your legal services are involved, those cases can be very cheap to, to resolve or depending whether you take it to court and there are appeals. I mean, you were talking tens, hundreds of thousands for cases that are, we had one case go seven years, uh, here at fire, you know, millions of dollars. Um, it can be, it can be pretty tough. When can we expect to hear about, you know, your first cases we're recording now today's, uh, the afternoon of March 18th. I don't know when this will, this usually comes out every other Thursday. So probably next Thursday. Um, will we have heard about a first case by that point? Or are you uh, still, you may not have it? heard yet about a first case. We are, we are actively starting to think about, um, cases. Certainly we're getting lots of requests from people who want to call our attention to cases. Um, and, and my initial inclination is that, um, there's going to be several circumstances, where the uh, first option should probably be to write privately to university leaders to encourage them to um, uh, do the right thing in these particular controversies and see how much we progress we can make uh, by trying to talk to people behind the scenes. Um, there are other circumstances where either that doesn't work and we need to be much more public about um, our concerns, or we ought to be public um, in the first place. Um, and so we may be uh, uh, doing things and actively involved in some controversies, um, and yet it may not be as visible to the general public um, uh, yet um, as, as it will be over time. Um, but there may well be some public statements, at least, that get issued fairly soon, in part because some of these controversies are just already so public. All the relevant information is, is already public. Um, that's certainly true of a lot of these controversies that emerge out of um, social media uh, controversies where somebody says something um, inflammatory on Twitter, people are calling for them to be fired. Um, all the relevant information is right there out in the open. The, the whole dispute is already very public. Um, the goal really is to try to help uh, then um, put some weight on the other side of the scale as, as university presidents are thinking about what to do. Um, so in those kind of circumstances, you can imagine going public very quickly. Um, other kinds of cases 
they're more fact intensive, more complicated to even figure out what's going on. Maybe there's more to be gained by uh, uh, proceeding a little more quietly at first. Yeah. Are you, so what's your role in the organization? You were obviously involved in the early creation of it, but you seem to have become the leading spokesperson. I just got done reading an article you had published today in National Review Online. Um, are you the president or what, what's the... <laughs> So, so technically my title is the uh, chair of the academic committee. Um, so the okay. academic committee is the governing um, uh, decision-making board for the, for the organization. It's a uh, diverse group of faculty who um, are fortunately willing to uh, spend some time on this and, and help us work through cases and then make decisions about what kinds of statements we ought to issue, uh, when should we spend money on uh, legal uh, defenses uh, and the like. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm chair of that committee. Um, the, we also have a legal advisory committee that um, uh, is composed of mostly non-academic lawyers who can help advise us on the legal issues um, involved and whether or not there are um, uh, credible legal claims to be defended here. Um, we were very fortunate to attract a, a very distinguished group um, of lawyers to um, that body. And so I'm confident uh, we're going to get a lot of great advice and they're going to be very helpful in, in helping us think through what to do in, in some of these individual cases and with some of these particular controversies. Um, so we encourage the members to speak out generally about these issues. We hope they do. Um, uh, but uh, as much as possible, we're sort of hoping to limit how many people are, are trying to speak uh, on on behalf of the institution. Uh, and so we're, we're, we are trying to limit that to mostly to me. <laughs> are you going to have like a management staff too, like a full-time staff that handles? Uh, we do um, have some staff and I am very thankful that we do. Um, it's very small, uh, but, but dedicated. Um, uh, but, but, but it's obvious already that um, uh, there's just a tremendous amount of work for them to do. Uh, we may have to grow that staff um, over time. Uh, as I've gotten advice from people who've, uh, been involved in these kinds of organizations over time. Uh, they, they're certainly convinced we're going to need more staff support uh, for what we're doing um, just to be able to manage the cases and investigate what's going on, uh, you know, handle the myriad things that come along with actually being an organization. Um, so it's, uh, uh, I, I'm very grateful though, to, we have, we have two uh, people on staff and they're, they're doing terrific work um, and have been for, for a while now of getting us to the point we're at now. So where does the, uh, AUP fit in with all this, the American Association of University Professors, uh, you know, another union of professors uh, that in part does academic freedom work, um, but uh, might have been less, might be less vocal in, in recent years as, um, you know, there's just been an uptick and overload of cases. Well, I do think that's part of it, right? I mean, that, that we are in a position now where there are just so many cases uh, that every organization that's working in this space is overwhelmed um, and can't possibly take them all on. Um, and so- uh, Including having, fire. Including fire. <laughs> Adam right? Steinbaugh, so, who is the director of our Individual Rights Defense Program, might have gotten on average three hours of sleep last summer. Right, uh, right. It was, <laughs> summer's usually the quiet time. Last yeah, exactly. Was the busiest- in our 22 years, your history. Yeah. So, so I think of this as being a complementary organization to both FIRE and the AUP. Um, it's like AUP, it's a faculty led organization. Um, uh, and un unlike FIRE, which is a staff uh, driven uh, organization, um, uh, like AUP, we are focused on uh, faculty speech rights. And unlike FIRE, which also uh, is worried about uh, student speech rights and, and works on that front. Um, in some ways, the, the legal claims that we're concerned with defending um, uh, are, are there to be defended because of the work the AUP put in, especially in the early part of the 20th century, that um, a tremendous number of American universities have incorporated into their governing charters um, uh, principles of academic freedom that the AUP had advocated for. Um, and those uh, now are contractual rights that uh, faculty can take advantage of, and we want them to take advantage um, of it. Um, I think the AUP's traditional model of how they operate has been um, somewhat slow and deliberate. Um, uh, they're often coming in after the fact and um, uh, deciding whether or not to uh, their traditional tool for uh, sanctioning and, uh, and discouraging universities from engaging in bad behavior um, is to censure institutions for um, uh, things that they have, have done in the past. Um, I think 
our view is you need to be a little more nimble than that to move faster, to try to get involved in the controversies while they're still occurring um, in order to uh, put more weight on, on those things. Um, it's also true AUP um, at this point ha does have a very diverse mission. They, they also focus on a lot of other things that concern faculty. Um, and on many campuses, they, they serve as a collective bargaining unit and a, and a labor union uh, for faculty. So academic freedom now is part of their mission, but it's not uh, the exclusive or even dominant part of their mission. Um, and so I, I think there's room for an organization that um, is also faculty driven, shares basically the same principles of academic freedom that AUP was founded on, um, uh, but is uh, much more narrowly focused on this specific mission and is, does not um, get entangled in, in a variety of other conflicts that are also important and concern faculty, but, um, uh, but I think we want to be uh, very focused on what we're doing. Are you all a uh, nonprofit tax exempt organization? Uh, where do people go to if they want to support you all who end their So not we, we are a nonprofit. Our, uh, our tax status is pending, um, but, but we are in the probationary stage, I guess, and well on our way to um, having that finalized. Um, so we, we do expect the donations to be um, uh, tax deductible. Um, uh, we have a website um, up and running for Academic Freedom Alliance. Um, and there's a, a donation button right there conveniently on the page. Um, uh, and, and we are certainly actively seeking donations. This is going to be um, an expensive enterprise if we're going to be effective. Um, as you say, it costs money and it's not always predictable as how much money it's going to cost um, to provide uh, legal support um, to individuals in these situations. The more funds and resources we have available to us, the more we'll be able to uh, uh, to do, um, and the better job we'll be able to do in in actually advancing the protection of free speech um, on on campuses. And so, uh, we're we're actively in the business of trying to raise uh, more funds um, so we can we can embark on that mission and, and pursue it more aggressively. <laughs> you you all have the. URL website URL of academicfreedom.org, which it just astounds me that that URL was available. Uh, it's perfect. Uh, so I'd encourage people to go check it out. The website looks great as well, too. By way of closing here, Professor Whittington, um, just want to get your general perspective. You've been teaching for a long time. How have, how has this dynamic on campus changed? Do you think the situation for professors has deteriorated over the course of your career or has it remained relatively stable with upticks of problems every so often? And just, yeah, the, you I, know, your engagement with the students. Right. I mean, are, are the students becoming more involved in these sort of campaigns to censure professors in a way they weren't previously? Yeah, I don't think there was ever a golden age in which um, uh, there were no threats to academic freedom and, and everything was going swimmingly. Right? Not even yeah. one day in like 1970? Or... Uh, there might have been a day. <laughs> I'm sure for sure. That's what Greg day. likes to say. But, yeah. yeah, but I think there are better and worse periods, right? And so, and so these are constant threats. There's constant temptations to want to um, suppress people from the other side, people you disagree with. As you note, um, if you look at uh, the survey literature on these things, um, uh, Americans have, have always been, said they're very supportive of free speech um, as a general principle, but if you start asking them about concrete cases, they pretty quickly start qualifying and backing off um, of those things. And so um, I don't think we should ever be complacent or imagine that these are not going to be a, uh, problems. Um, but um, having said that, I, I do think that uh, when I was starting my academic career in the mid-90s, um, it was a better situation, all things considered, than it is now. Um, I mostly took academic freedom issues for granted, um, partially as a function of the kinds of institutions I was at. It was easier to do um, than it might have been even then at some other places. Um, but I think we're now in a, in a environment that is broadly much more hostile to free speech and academic freedom um, than it was even 10 years ago, um, uh, faculty at a much wider swath of universities are, and, and across a much wider array of disciplines um, are, are concerned about these issues and worry about these issues now compared to uh, what was true uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, so for example, it was once the case where I think the colleagues in the sciences 
um, uh, would sort of look uh, on the other side of campus and say, uh, you people have a lot of problems over in the humanities and social sciences. Thank goodness we don't have any of those problems over here. Um, back to the lab. Um, and and that's just not true anymore. I think instead now they look around and say, wait, this stuff is, is now um, an issue for us too. Um, it's affecting what's happening in professional schools like law schools and, and uh, medical schools. Um, it's affecting parts of campus that didn't affect before. So I think there is um, uh, a lot of concern. And moreover, the, the, um, uh, the sources of, of threats to academic freedom are quite expansive these days. And so um, I do think it's true that, that students um, uh, are frequently calling for faculty to be fired in ways that was uh, not so true uh, 10 or 15 years ago. Um, uh, but you, at the same time that you're getting that kind of rising uh, student pressure um, on faculty speech, um, you're also getting uh, various outside activist groups that um, are constantly monitoring uh, what's happening on campuses and and sometimes calling for faculty to be um, fired. You yeah, there it. wasn't social media in the 90s, so uh, there wasn't that sort of organizing vehicle for those sorts of calls. Yeah, I think it's both. A, the internet makes it easier to mobilize that kind of opposition to free speech, and it also makes uh, faculty speech much more visible than it was before, right? That there's one thing about social media is is uh, the world is now getting uh, uh, some impression of what the unfiltered views of faculty are, and they don't always like it. Yeah. Um, and, <laughs> and, you know, and uh, you know, there's there's real risk of of uh, people being that visible on on social media, and it's it generates a lot of these kinds of controversies um, as as a consequence. And so, um, and so, in some ways, you can look across the last hundred years and and pick out oh, sometimes politicians are a problem, sometimes donors are a problem, sometimes students are a problem um, uh, for uh, the state of free speech on campus and academic freedom. Uh, we're now in an environment when they're all a problem. <laughs> and so there's just a lot of forces uh, arrayed against academic freedom. And so I, I think it's all hands on deck uh, then in trying to protect this and, and hopefully secure uh, these kinds of protections for the next generation of faculty. Yeah, we were, there was when I first started as a full-time staffer at FIRE in 2012, uh, we thought we were busy then. And I kind of look back at those times, uh, <laughs> like the Shire, you know, you got the, 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 you know, the, from the Lord of the Rings, you got beautiful green grass and there's birds chirping and music playing and, uh, fires in the hearth. Uh, and now I feel like we're, we've been amidst Mordor since 2014 and it's just, uh, constantly a struggle. Uh, no, it's a lot of truth in that. I mean, if uh, if you had asked me ten years ago if I'd be uh, even joining an organization like this, let alone leading an organization like this, or if I'd be writing all the time about free speech issues, I mean, I, I as you say, I, I teach constitutional law, I write about constitutional law as well as other things, but I mostly focused um, professionally on separation of powers concerns and federalism concerns and and other structural features of the Constitution. Um, I didn't spend a lot of time uh, writing about um, uh, rights issues, including free speech issues, um, even though I was teaching it, um, you know, now it's on my agenda. <laughs> and yeah, yeah. Now it's, it's taking up my time and energy, but it's also uh, more my scholarly agenda. It's more what I'm researching and writing about, um, uh, precisely because it, it has risen in importance and it really demands attention um, in a way that I, I wasn't expecting. Well, Professor Whittington, I think we'll have to leave it there. It's great to have the Academic Freedom Alliance uh, joining us in the cause. It's great to have you on FIRE's board of directors. Uh, you're my boss, uh, technically. <laughs> so uh, please give me so a I good review on this one. You. Yeah, yeah. If you can criticize it, just email me. Don't email uh, my direct reports. Right. But uh, uh, very excited to have you aboard, and thanks for coming on the show. I really appreciate it. Thank you. That was Princeton professor Keith Whittington. He is a founding member of the Academic Freedom Alliance, which you can learn more about and donate to at the best URL out there, academicfreedom.org. What a great URL. So jealous of that. This podcast is hosted, produced, and recorded by me, Nico Perino, and edited by Aaron Reese. To learn more about So To Speak, you can follow us on Twitter at twitter.com slash free speech talk or like us on Facebook at facebook.com slash so to speak podcast. You can also email us feedback at so to speak at thefire.org, and we also take, in, take calling questions, which you can leave a voicemail for at 215-315-0100. If you enjoyed this episode, consider leaving us a review at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts. They do help us attract 
new listeners to the show. And until next time, I thank you all again for listening. 